What's up, Niagara? Welcome to another episode of Gorge Views. This one is Swanee, Niagara. In this episode, we're simply going to do a January recap, a little February forward, some teasers on what we'll be covering in February, and we're going to be talking about Swanee, Niagara. So we did seven episodes in January, and that all fell on the heels of the Niagara Green video that we produced and put out there in December. Now the seven videos covered quite a swath of concepts, kind of to lay the foundation of what we want to discuss probably all year long. Now we had the birds, key to Niagara's future video, where we pose the question, are birds the key to Niagara's future? Our answer at Gorge Views is yes. Then we did Niagara Wow, where we tried to help inspire you. Tried to help Niagara fall in love with itself again. Tried to explain how the rest of the world sees us. Then we got into what's great about the Niagara Egret, where we tried to build on that inspiration by showing you, you know, some of the great birds we have available in our area that we, A, may not be aware of, B, should be aware of and should go appreciate and enjoy and C, share with others. And then we did a four-part series that we called Hockey Niagara. Each episode in the four parts featured a different hawk that you can see right here in Niagara Falls, the rough-legged hawk, the sharp shin, the coopers, and the red tail. And throughout all of this, we introduced and in tried to reinforce understanding of various concepts. Chief among those is the concept of bird wealth, right, where we talked about, um, yeah, it's the number of varieties of species that you have, the numbers of each species that you have, and the ease with which you might be able to go view those different species. I think it's important to continue to do a steady drumbeat on one aspect of birding that we are particularly rich with and that's sight lines you know we're bordered by the Niagara River and the Niagara Gorge and if you look at Niagara County as a whole you have the whole lakeshore and that allows you to see miles frankly so with spotting scopes and binoculars typical tools most birders have with long telephoto lenses which all bird photographers have and, and many birders use you can easily see all of these different species and they're all going to the waterfront um, for various reasons. That alone makes us quite bird wealthy. The fact that we are a Ramsar designated site and an Audubon designated globally important bird area, you know, tells the world we are important. We have birds here and those birds are important. But we do have a decent number of species and some of those you can't see anywhere else in the world easily. You know, the rough-legged hawk, you got to go up to the Arctic tundra or be lucky enough to see it if one like the snowy owl happens to migrate down here. It's very similar behavior. We also discuss the need for a cultural change. Since the end of the industrial era, our community has endeavored to transition to the new era, an era that is yet to be named. What if the real struggle is the name itself? What if we are at the point where the future can be whatever we name it? You know, it's our view that we remain an industrial culture for really no reason. We're, we're clinging to an industrial past and we need to take on an ecological culture all right we in our personality and our dna locally we should be ecology focused not industrial focused you know we believe and that's why we called it you know our destiny you know in the niagara green video i, I it's our view in reviewing the past and analyzing the history of niagara falls that the industrial era just kind of created a little boomtown blip for niagara falls Right, kind of sidetracked us from what is probably our true destiny as the custodians of a natural wonder, and that's having an ecological focus 
and that's our strength. And we squandered that. We have to recover from that. We've made a lot of progress. We should appreciate that progress. We should build on that progress. I um, talked about what I'm calling the Niagara Green movement and how I see that and provided a, a structure. And we're going to go into that. We're going to review that here in a second. And of course, I introduced various concepts like ecotourism, ecology, and soil Research health. and scientific observation have concurrently revealed that the CO2 problems and many other global threats are actually related to soil. It has been pointed out that humans have been killing the soil for millennia, but this issue has been accelerated by industrialization over the past century. In the mid-90s, a number of scientists began realizing what was happening as a result of our ongoing reactions to challenges that arose. So I've said several times, and I'll probably say it several more times over the course of the year, that we've been running on a three-month economy since the end of the industrial era. You know, during that boomtown blip, we had a 12-month economy you know, that was run by the wages of the local labor working in industry. Now, you know, we just passively accept the tourist market that we get. I don't believe we have deliberately developed our tourist economy. Niagara Falls, Ontario, they really have. You know, and they built on the strength of being very close to Toronto, which is a, you know, 7 million person population. They just need to get a few of those people every weekend to come visit Niagara Falls, Ontario, to keep the lights on, to maintain those buildings, to pay the heat bills, and to keep the minimum staffing that they need to get through the winter. And you don't see high-rise hotels in Niagara Falls, New York, because we haven't developed something that can sustain a high-rise hotel. It's a very different economic model to do a, you know, a 250-room hotel, you know, the what we call a box hotel, and smaller, versus a high-rise hotel with, you know, five, six, seven hundred rooms like, you know, the other country in the area, the Seneca, right? That's a 12-month destination. They have a way of pulling people in that hotel. And that building, quite frankly, doesn't run off of the accommodation. It runs off of the activity that's putting people in the accommodation or in the accommodations, the gambling. So we have to understand these nuanced differences in these different economic models. You know, Canada's kind of done the same thing. They've made an adult playground. You know, they've chosen to leverage their view of Niagara Falls and compete against places like Morocco and Vegas. Um, I, think, I think we have an opportunity to have zero competition in the ecotourism space. You know, as I evaluate the rest of the planet in this ecotourism concept, I don't see anyone who is really living up to ecotourism. You know, I mean, they're leveraging ecological wealth, say like birds or, or other things, or just having a rainforest or the redwood forest or like our national parks. But, you know, they have this um, friction. The more success they have in the tourism space, the more they need to develop to support that space and the more they detract from that wealth, that ecology that they're highlighting, right? Whereas Niagara Falls, we already have it. The damage is done as far as man's impact on this environment. We can only improve on it and we are improving on it and we can improve on it much further. And those other nine months of the year, we're not utilizing the sustainability the human sustainment infrastructure that we have, right? So focusing on those other nine months doesn't impact our environment, right? It impacts our economy in a positive way, but it doesn't ne negatively impact our environment. And so we've got to figure that out. And we've got to develop that in a deliberate fashion. And that's what this year and for Gorge Views is totally about. It's what we're going to be focusing on. You know, we want to come up with solutions. So the Niagara Green Movement, if you missed that video, I'm going to put a link here above so you guys can go watch where I went into more detail on the Niagara Green Movement. But just to reiterate, and we'll keep coming back to this several, several times until we start to have a more 
reciprocal conversation and, and people start to weigh in and add value to what I'm presenting here. But what we're talking about in the Niagara Green Movement is a globally transformative approach for local economic growth. Globally transformative. And we're going to do that using the pillars of ecotourism on a foundation of soil health. Because ecotourism is ecology plus tourism. You, know, you have to protect, you have to build, you have to understand ecology. You have to share your local ecology with your tourist. And soil health is the foundation of all life on the planet. Pests are attacking our plants. Let's make a pesticide. Now that we've made a pesticide, we're having trouble with the plants and it's the weeds choking them out, so let's make an herbicide. Now that we're fighting the weeds and the pests really well, the plants don't have these nutrients, so let's make some synthetic fertilizers. As we started tilling soil millennia ago, we started disturbing the soil biome. The process is simply that whereby the plants and trees produce starches and sugars, it transmits those to the soils, which attract a certain type of microbe and trades with the elements that the plants need. Soil is seen by many as a real problem, as scientific research increasingly points out. And soil health is the foundation of all life on the planet. If you don't understand that, if you don't get that, well, stick with us. We're going to keep building on that knowledge base so that we locally can understand in a far deeper, far more meaningful way what soil health is, how you achieve soil health, how you sustain soil health, and how that helps your community regardless of tourism, right? And how that helps the globe regardless of tourism. And that's the globally transformative part. What if we're killing the planet? What if the United Nations is right about the soil and we only have 60 years left of soil health? What if we are creating the ocean dead zones and the fish are dying? What if the insects are disappearing and we need them? What if the birds are dying and we need them? What if we can change all that? What if we hold the world in our hands? What if it's our destiny to do that very thing? Because not only will we improve our own community and our own health, but as we host millions of tourists from well over 100 nations, you know, hundreds of cultures, because many nations have several cultures within them, we're going to be sharing this knowledge. We're going to be showing them concrete examples of the implementation of ecological principles that maintain soil health and enrich your own community. They're going to return to their own environment and apply those. You're going to end up reversing the human damage across the entire planet in land management and start sequestering a lot more carbon out of the atmosphere. They're going to change their agricultural practices that are consuming unnecessarily a whole lot of fossil fuels, which is causing more emissions of putting CO2 in the atmosphere, and in so doing, improve the sequestration rate of that soil so that you're removing carbon from the atmosphere. That's globally transformative, folks. Now, in February, we're going to be doing a lot more highlighting of winter birds. Um, and we're going to do some e-bird highlights, and you'll see what those are about as we get into February. But I, th I think that'll be enlightening to us all. We're going to transition from talking about the regenerative agricultural side of soil health and that more rule-focused, large-scale land management and bring it more down to... And I won't call it micro, um, but the smaller scale, the lawn scale side of things. But when you add up all the different lawns in urban and suburban environments, you're talking about a lot of property. When you start talking about the public parks and public property, like just look at the lawn around our police station, the lawn around our schools, the lawn around City Hall, all of High Park property, all the other parks we have in the city. When you start adding all of that up, you're starting this, that's a significant portion of land and applying the same principles 
it is very important. And that's also what we use to set those concrete examples to our tourists, is all of this different property, right? High Park's the center of our city. Our tourists are always on the edge of the city. Our economy is being injured, even in the summertime, by not pulling them into our city. So as we build on all of the conservation efforts that have surrounded the city via the state parks, we start to draw them into it. Setting up ecotourism-centric attractions, you know, that pull them from the park. They're going to go to the park. They're going to do all that stuff. I've mentioned it before. And that's why we're also going to talk about more the economics of ecotourism, which will include the economics of tourism, but the economics of ecology. And those are two distinctly separate things by themselves. Right? There's economics that are very valuable to the human race within the sphere of ecology alone. Obviously, there's economics that are very valuable to the human race because it's a human behavior in tourism alone. There's a synergy if you combine them. And there's places, like I alluded to earlier, that are attempting it, doing it, calling what they're doing in tourism. But as I look at it closely and look at the nuance and look at the frictions, I'm not sure anyone's really doing it well. There's no capital of ecotourism on the planet. You know, there's plenty of places to highlight, oh, that's a great ecotourism destination, and that's a great ecotourism destination. But it only is because we said it is. But by definition and by all the various criteria, you know, I think there's a fair argument to be made that they're not, that no one is a champion. Like Orlando is a champion of, of family-centric tourism, right? Vegas is the capital of adult entertainment tourism, country music tourism in Nashville, bluegrass in Branson, Missouri, you know, theater on Broadway in New York City, Paris maybe is a cultural tourism icon. But I don't think anyone's really established themselves as the king of ecotourism. And we have that chance. While thinking through the kind of tourism attractions that will enhance the guest's experience, be self-sustaining, and create a multi-seasonal draw, Jeff believes an assortment of ecotourist attractions play to our strengths. Among them is the Bird Education and Aviary Center of Niagara, or Beacon for short. Niagara Falls is already a Ramsar Convention designated site and an Autobahn designated globally significant important bird area. It draws tourists year-round primarily because the best birding occurs during spring and fall migrations and during the winter when we host thousands of waterfowl and gull species and tourism is so low. further ado, I want to get into Swanee, Niagara. Now, I don't know if you guys have, have noticed, but what I've been attempting to do subtly in all my videos is um, employ bird puns, right? Hockey Niagara was that aggressive selling of it. You know, Swanee, Niagara, ugh. As I transition from January to February and kind of shift focus and advance the ball on this rather nuanced, complex argument, but not so complex that we can't all understand it. We just got to, it's an elephant, basically. We got to bite it one bite at a time. You know, I think it's a good time to, to focus on this concept of swanning. If you never heard the term then let's review what swanning means. Swanning is to move about or go somewhere in a casual, relaxed way. And it's typically perceived as irresponsible or ostentatious by others. I'm going to ignore the ostentatious part and focus on the irresponsible part. That's what I believe we've been doing in Niagara Falls. We've been moving uh, into the future. Casually, relaxed, not in a deliberate manner. And we've been moving irresponsibly into that future. All right, we've got to stop swanning in that regard. If you think about swanning as going out and seeing swans, like birding is going out and seeing birds, that we should do way more of. And to kind of, you know, motivate you to do that 
I'm gonna jump over here and I'm gonna look at uh, Sandy Gershwinder, um, or Gershwinder, I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. Sorry, Sandy. Um, Sandy's a Facebook friend. We became Facebook friends because she's a great bird photographer, Erie County resident. Um, she does come in and capture the birds here in Niagara County quite often, and that is great to see. You know, she, she appreciates our parks. I've seen her photos in Wilson. She's inspired me to go out onto the lake shore and, and capture various birds in the past. But, you know, she captured very well a flock of um, tundra swans from Beaver Island. So this is the Niagara River that they're on. But, you know, he, you know, I don't like, you know, I like to keep it Niagara County focused and Niagara Falls focused. But you can see these birds from our shore right here in the city. And they're the birds that actually inspired me first to go get my first telephoto lens. And when that wasn't, didn't have enough reach, I went and got the second telephoto lens. And then even that doesn't quite have to reach, but that has more to do with atmospheric distortion. You know, I was doing sunrises in the late fall, air's getting cold, but the river's still warm. So you've got that heat distortion. So from those distances, you just can't get a crisp shot. Go over the Beaver Island, though, and you get much, much closer to them. And sometimes you're lucky on a given day. They might be closer to American Shore. But from our shoreline in Niagara Falls, you know, I mean, you can watch them through binoculars, through a spotting scope or a long lens. You're just not going to get a crisp, awesome, inspiring, detailed photo like Sandy here has captured. Now, I mean, just look at these birds. Look at this. Like you'll see something like this National Geographic, and I think the photographer went all the way up to the Arctic to capture it. But now this is the scenes we get to enjoy right here. You're wondering, what can I do with the kids Saturday? Take them out and show them this. Get them inspired. Set the kids up with the eBird account. Let them start observing birds and learning to identify them, learning their behaviors, and logging their own life list now. And as they grow and travel more, they'll add to that life list. And that's going to help instill a lot of ecological principles and appreciation and pro-social behaviors in them. Why not? Why not? Put on the boots, put on the hats, put on the gloves. But, you know, the other thing, I mean, Sandy is a bird photographer. Right? And birding, to me, is an umbrella of many different human behaviors, right? One is going out and identifying the birds and counting them and studying them. You know, that's one birding behavior. The learning behavior, just a basic appreciation behavior. Then you know, I have what you call the backyard birders. You know, that behavior is unique from the other one because backyard birders to me are people who are drawing the birds to them versus going out and seeing them. They're drawing the birds to them, and it's a very valuable human behavior where you're you're increasing the available food to the birds, which ethically I think is fair in this space because of the amount of habitat we have removed from birds. So as a human, we're just kind of returning some of that. You know, a lot of other backyard birders, though, they don't just put feeders out. They improve their property, creating more attractive habitat for birds, which to me is a step above just simply putting out feeders. And I see personally, ethically, nothing wrong with the feeder side. You know, I see a lot more value in the creating the habitat side. Going back to all the property we have in Niagara Falls, the public property, and doing the right things with those property as a community, right? Because that's our property, all those public properties, the lawn around City Hall and the police station and the parks, and it's our property. We should send a message to the rest of the world by how we landscape those properties, how we maintain those properties, what wildlife we invite to those properties. Because we're sharing the earth with a lot of other species, and these other species have benefits, and they are beautiful. And we owe it to future generations to conserve them, to improve their health, right, for our own benefit. Look at this photo, guys. Look at this photo. Sandy does a wonderful job. It's hard to appreciate if you're not a photographer just how hard it is to get a good exposure 
of you know a white bird on a white background when your camera wants to make it all gray it's so easy to overexpose and if you did overexpose you wouldn't have all these feather fine feather details in, in the bird so sandy's doing a great job makes a great layout and we should celebrate her as an artist you know a local artist a local hero look at this one look at the detail we're getting wings expanded great capture great composition just love them what a beautiful bird yeah a couple of them out there swimming together looks like they're having a conversation you know and if you just imagine what it's like to sit there and observe this in real time in motion you know it's fun you got a couple of uh i think mallards i'm not sure maybe canvas backs because i think i mean look at this you know this is the kind of capture i like to get because you really get um a feature of the bird which is that that water resistant that water repelling character of their feathers right it's the water's beaded on its neck you just wonder why is this thing not so how can it possibly fly if they're sitting there and soaking in the water all day long you know you've heard it i mean there's water rolling off a duck's back pretty cool and the same thing here we got the little droplets glistening fine feather detail perfect isolation of this bird don't you want to hang this on your wall? I do. But again, I mean, this is right here, right across the bridge from Niagara Falls over at Beaver Island. You would think you went to Alaska. You would think this was captured in the Arctic Circle. Something that, it's obviously cold, but it warms your heart, doesn't it? And we have so much to appreciate here. Uh, I, I like this uh, composition too. Look at them curving out to the right. Um, or the Fibonacci curve type um, composition. And get into photo composition terms. It's just more complex. Rule of thirds is something a lot of people go for. It's not a rule of thirds, but it does have those curves. Um, good job, Sandy. Good job. Yeah, they're having a conversation. Like, oh, yep, yeah, yeah, definitely canvas backs. Well, not me. I'm no bird expert, right? I'm still a rookie birder. I'm still learning my birds. Um, yeah, the tundra swan and the snow goose. Takes me a minute or two to make sure I know which one I'm looking at at any given time. I believe these are two canvas backs. If you know, comment below. Tell me I'm wrong. That's cool. But I see this behavior a lot too. The, the smaller waterfall kind of... Uh, Swimming next to one of the larger geese species. Yeah, I don't know if it's like that they just say, okay, I'll hang out with him because no one's going to mess with something that big. Wonderful stuff, guys. You should be inspired, right? That's a theme. Get inspired, be inspired, stay inspired, inspire others. Learn to love your environment. Learn to appreciate your environment because it gives us beauty and it gives us a whole lot more and it can give us prosperity if we treat it right. If you don't appreciate it though, you're not going to get prosperity from it. You're just going to abuse it, you're going to waste it, you're going to cause more co brownfields and toxic dumps, you know, and you're going to aid and abed others in a behavior that leaves a sad, toxic legacy. And we're going to be getting into that more and how we recover from it, because we can recover from it. We should recover from it, we will recover from it. So, trying to keep this one short, this transitional video from January to February. Thanks for watching. Please, like and share i mean take the video and share it onto your own facebook pages particularly if you're a niagara county person so that more people get exposed there's only so many opportunities for them to see or hear it in their facebook feeds as i post the videos on facebook so many people will miss it i also get that this is competing against a lot of other more entertaining things right i mean i have a I have a face or radio a voice for print and you know the writing skills for the trash bin but i do think i'm presenting valuable content. So please try to watch the whole video. If you watch it in chunks, come back to it later. And do share it with others and start to participate in the conversation. I think by March we're going to be having more face-to-face -face community events. I'm talking with some others about that. So stay tuned for that so that we can all get together and, and really start um, taking all these abstract principles and applying them in a concrete way to move the ball forward. Stay inspired, Niagara. Thank you very much.